I welcome Professor Ashutosh for his talk. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, actually, let me put my microphone here. I, uh, it's a distinct pleasure for me to uh, be here. First of all, I'd like to thank all the organizing committee. Um, I uh, had a little bit of problem in my house. Uh, I live in Maryland, and I was planning to uh, cancel my trip. Uh, and Dr. Roy, uh, he actually motivated me. Uh, thankfully, my home situation got better, so I, I came. Uh, I'm glad I came. I made the right decision uh, by coming here. And um, I also didn't realize uh, this auditorium is uh, Dr. Bhupen Hajarika Auditorium. And uh, some of you might know Dr. Bhupen Hajarika did his PhD from Columbia University in 1954, uh, where I worked, and also got my PhD there. Uh, so it's a big tribute uh, to Dr. Bhupen Hajarika, who I think passed away in 2011. Uh, he I was a great philanthropist, uh, poet. Uh, if you have uh, heard his songs, his societal uh, songs, uh, he also was posthumously awarded Bharat Ratna. So it's a great honor. And I've been enjoying uh, the campus, the food, excellent, uh, all the volunteers. Let's see, this is working. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so with that, let me let me start the talk. And I know this is being recorded. So, in case some of your colleagues, I know some students have exams tomorrow. So, I really want to make sure uh, students get the benefit of this talk. So, with that, my talk, five uh, G networks application security. I will be covering. Uh, this is my outline. Uh, I have given similar talks uh, in academic environment. This is this is a mixed audience here. Some of you are experts. Uh, maybe you should be talking here in, instead of me. Um, so if things are a little basic, please forgive me. Uh, some of you have different background. So I wanted to make a balance of this. Uh, my focus is on 5G. Uh, what is 5G? I'll just give a little bit of history of what 5G is. Uh, now people are talking about 6G, 6th generation. And then, uh, why do you need a 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G? We are doing research as scientists, engineers. Uh, so there has to be some fundamental reason why we need a next generation, right? And I know there is an interesting panel right after this talk. Uh, then I'll focus on security aspects. Every time there is a new network, evolution of new network, um, there are new security issues. And people try to solve the previous problems they try to, uh, but new features get added, so that also gives rise to uh, challenges. And there are opportunities too. So I'll talk about that. Uh, some use cases, uh, there have been a lot of discussion yesterday, Professor Devabrata Das you know, was telling how to introduce the standards, testbed activity. So it is kind of theory to practice. So once, I mean, I also teach 5G course, courses at Johns Hopkins University, and students say, you know, Professor, you are teaching us all this theory, which is good, we should learn that, but how do we know how 5G will looks like? Uh, can we get access to 5G labs? I know in India, IISCIT and Government of India, they have uh, been building the 5G testbed, which is a very commendable effort, right? So it can be accessible to the students. So I'll give some example uh, within the United States, National Science Foundation has built some labs, testbeds, how can you make use of those? How can you bring those uh, from open source? How can you build your own test bed? Um, then future networks, which I've been uh, founding co-chair uh, within IEEE, there are many standards, but this is something forward-looking initiative. We look at three year, five year, 10 year down the road, how things are going to look like. IEEE is an open, neutral platform, about 420,000 professional members, many of you are here today. Uh, and how we are contributing uh, to the ecosystem. There are many standards bodies, like TGPP, TSDSI, you know, which is Indian standards bodies, right? Uh, ITU, uh, how ITPL is contributing to this effort. All right. So with that, a little bit of history. So what you are seeing here is communication is so important. Uh, people say uh, it is the civil engineering of 21st century, right? 
Uh, in 20th century, uh, uh, civil engineering was the marble, and 21st century, it is the communication. And if you look at this chart, how we have moved along, right? Some of you have studied data communication or taught data communication, you will appreciate this figure. So people used to have, um, you know, in horse, uh, pigeons, uh, that's how, let's see, make sure this, you can hear me, right? Yeah. So uh, horse, pigeons, so that's, I mean, people still uh, uh, use pigeons nowadays, right, in many parts of the world. And then uh, optical telegraph, electric telegraph, you know, there has been an evolution. Uh, so message switching, basically it was message switching, right? Um, then um, circuit switching with uh, Graham Bell, um, it uh, came around 1878. Um, you see that picture, uh, the patent picture of uh, 1875, uh, how you yeah, have the initial sketch of how telephone uh, is going to work. And then um, packet switching. Um, I am part of a committee with Bim Sir, uh, who is the father of the internet, uh, Len Kleinrock uh, and Bob Kahn, right? They, these are the three guys who developed the internet, ARPANET. Uh, so yesterday, in fact, uh, I had a meeting with Bim Sir. I told him that, you know, I've come to IIT Guwahati. Uh, he, by the way, he he got the Medal of Honor for IEEE this year, uh, if you can look him up. Uh, so he was happy, you know, so he hasn't visited this place, maybe we should bring him someday. Uh, so, packet switching started in 1970, the first packet that was transferred from uh, UCLA, uh, Professor Len Kleinrock, uh, to SRI, Stanford Research Institute uh, uh, in Palo Alto, right? Uh, and then after that, obviously, the TCP IP was developed. Uh, then at the same time, public switch telephone network, PSTN, uh, circuit switch network, right? And then now, we fast forward, we are, uh, a lot of things happen in between, right? I mean, I'll give some example of that. It's not a uh, history of uh, telecom uh, talk, but just to give you some history. Uh, and next generation internet 2020, now we are, 5G is getting deployed, 60 people are thinking about, right? And and again, it's not only wireless, there are wired aspects to optics. Uh, so with that background, why do we need it, right, to begin with? So we need it because application demands. Uh, so if you try to compare the previous type of application, we have just SMS, text, email. Uh, but every time there is a new emerging application that has high, high bandwidth requirement, low latency requirement, right? So if you look at this chart, um, Every application has a need to have different types of KPIs, the key performance indicator, right? Like high bandwidth, low latency, bursty traffic, uh, IoT type, sensing traffic, all those, right? So if you have to support that, your network, underlying network that will carry those traffic has to be flexible, scalable, uh, programmable, all those, right? And that's how uh, the whole evolution network, I mean, high, you know, think about like Ethernet, uh, 1980s, uh, it has like 10, 10 uh, megabit, 100 megabit, gigabit, now, you know, terabit, and was, these things are going on. So there is a bandwidth thing and there are other things going on, right? So end of the day, it is the application that drives. So when people are thinking about 6G, um, they are thinking about what other emerging application we can do. Then the other thing we need to consider, who are the end users, right? Uh, so I was talking to folks in Sankhya Labs, how they were using, uh, everybody using this, uh, uh, you know, every vegetable, everything is linked to their payment system. That's pretty amazing, right? How uh, quickly you can get things done. Uh, so end of the day, what I'm showing here, end user, uh, they are going to be benefiting from evolution of this technology. That means your intelligent transportation system, we have, uh, robotics at home, e-health, smart grids, etc., etc. Right. So, and each of these applications, like verticals, like agriculture, for example, it's not just telephone anymore. It's not just talking to people or watching movie. Um, other verticals are going to take advantage of this uh, communication infrastructure. Right. So we need to keep that in mind. So these are kind of the motivational factors that help us to think about what's going to come ten years from now. So everybody is working into that. People are doing PhDs, right? Uh, so let's keep continue to do that. Okay, now I say a little bit about the wireless access. Since this, I talk about 5G, which is fifth generation, 
Uh, what you're seeing in this picture is 1980 when we had the whole analog, uh, everything was analog, every country had their own analog system, right? Uh, um, for example, entity, uh, uh, amps in America, and then every 10 years since then, there has been an evolution of a new generation of cellular network, right? Uh, and you can see there are two camps, the 3GPP third generation partnership program, which uh, kind of dominating the specifying the standards, and then you have 3GPP2, uh, on the bottom, there was Qualcomm CDMA focus, right? So there was two standard supports going on, and I was heavily involved in 3GPP2. And if you see the the bit rate was going up, uh, your uh, multi, you know, CDMA, FDMA, TDMA, the different uh, access scheme. But around 2008, uh, I think everybody jumped the boat and they put their hands on 3GPP. So then at that point, like Horizon, every operator had different things. Horizon was using uh, 3GPP2, uh, Sprint was using 3GPP2. Even within India, I think, um, IDEA probably, they were using uh, CDMA, Qualcomm CDMA. But then they finally moved to 3GPP, and 3GPP uh, moved ahead, and now LTE long-term evolution that was born. In 2010, the first 4G got started, and then, now we are in the process of deploying 5G, right? It takes almost 10 years, so the requirement comes from ITU and 3GPP takes it, and I'll talk about it a little later. And then on the 5G side, uh, there are three different buckets, enhanced mobile broadband, ultra reliable low latency, machine to machine type communication. So again, if you try to map that with the application that I talked about, um, that's how the mapping is. All right, so this is the cellular revolution, and now 6G is going on. There are a lot of interesting talks you might have listened to. What are the new things coming up? This is still in a research phase. Now, the other thing is we all have been using Wi-Fi. We shouldn't forget about that. Although it is not a cellular network, they are coexisting, right? So, so this is a chart from uh, Professor Gerard Petweis. Uh, he was my colleague, co-chair at 5G Lab. Uh, this, this was his prediction, and uh, with his permission, I'm using it. So what you're seeing here, there is a uh, parallel, parallel uh, evolution on the cellular side, uh, on, on the bottom one, right, the red. And then 811 also has been going on, which is IEEE uh, landman standards. And Baltimore attended that a few weeks back. So right now they are working on Wi-Fi 7, which is 802.11BE. So that's going to go. I mean, continue to grow and cellular. So there has to be coexistence. So people, the students, or even my colleagues, the faculty uh, who are looking into research, uh, this is an interesting area of research. There are a lot of features in cellular not there in Wi-Fi. Things like priority service. Uh, how do we make sure uh, you have no interoperability issues? If you have a quality of service in cellular, you are moving to Wi-Fi 7. How do you maintain that? How do you maintain the handoff, seamless mobility? So those are some interesting issues uh, people can look into. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Wi-Fi today, but I just thought I'd highlight that because this is important. All right, let's get into 5G now. So the way it works, um, the ITU, which is the International Telecommunication Union, uh, consists, I think many of you have probably members of that, uh, country-specific membership, they come up with these requirements. Uh, almost five years before, the, they, they already started working for 6G. So to 2025, they will give a report to 3GPP, which is standardization activities, and then they will come up with a specification. That's how it happens. I think that the panel, they probably will talk about some of those. Uh, but this is the 5G thing, as you see, 2015, um, that report, September 2015, this was handed over to 3GPP which is uh, 2010, 4G started, right? So about five years, they get the final report. The next five years, uh, 3GPP worked on and developed different standards uh, for 5, uh, 5G. And on the right side, you see those are the KPIs, right? For enhanced mobile broadband, uh, then uh, ultra low latency and massive machine to machine type communication. And the KPIs are peak data rate, spectrum efficiency, uh, you know, all downlink, uplink, uh, latency, the mobility, you know, these are the things that define, if you look at 3GPP specification, like hundreds, hundreds of days, right? Um, so when I teach my class, I have to take the ones that are important. Uh, and then um, 3GPP, then the vendors define, them, then they make the products, then operators deploy, right? So when I was in at and Labs, I was in, charge of making sure the deployment goes well. Uh, 
so I, I can tell you some uh, uh, experience of mine. So they, they, it happens in phase one, phase one, phase two, like that, right? So there are different religious, 16, 17, 18, 19. That's how it works. Uh, just to give you another idea of mapping the application, uh, this is another application where you see uh, three dimensions like latency, bandwidth, system control, uh, then programmability, etc. So if you see, uh, let's take a look at virtual reality. This works, yeah. So in virtual reality, this is, uh, it needs high bandwidth, um, also need low latency. Uh, so in that situation, the 4G system cannot take care of it, right? Or if you say industrial automation, it doesn't need high bandwidth, but it needs low latency. So it's, 4G still cannot take care of it, right? So 5G added additional enablers like S Cloud, uh, things like RSD and controller and new radio that helps to achieve this kind of application. On the other hand, if you see the quadrant here, uh, the 4G network itself can potentially take care of it, right? So now if we are looking to 6G, obviously the, the other kinds of application that uh, 5G network cannot take care of, so you have to design um, new parameters. So that's, that's a mapping between application uh, with the uh, enablers, then you define your architecture. So it depends who are your customers, right? Your customers just need like uh, low bandwidth type application, you probably don't need 5G. All right, so what is 5G all about, right? So, uh, so if you look at 5G, it is a complete ecosystem. It is not like my iPhone or Samsung phone talking to a cell tower. Um, you know, a lot of people who, just users like my mom, right? Uh, she may not know what 5G all about. There are a lot of complexity, interesting things happen, and if you see, uh, the top over here, right, these are like end users, uh, these are the access towers, uh, and the ACE cloud provide low latency, and this is something that stays within the operator's network, right? For example, when I was in AT&T, we had to build all this, so there's a user plane, there's a control plane. So when a user switches the phone on, it gets over this access tower, right, then goes to the control plane, and gets authenticated register, only after that you can send the traffic to internet or voice over uh, LTE or even Wi-Fi networks, all those, right? So this, there's a lot of complexity here. And when I talk about security, what are the problems uh, we have to solve for the security, right? So just to give you an idea, this is the whole end-to-end -end 5G system. It is not only the last hub. And when we say we are designing 5G or 3GPP is designing 5G, uh, it is designing the radio access network, which is this part. It's also designing all the interaction among different network functions, which are in the core of the network, uh, all also in the user plane, right? Uh, so these are all being defined there. And 3GPP defines the spec, but ITF, Internet Engineering Task Force, defines the protocols that make like, things like DNS, DSCP, all those, right? So ITF defines the protocol. There are about 6,000 of those. Anyway, so now uh, what I'll do is I just so on the on the left side you see uh, on the radio access side. So there's a new radio, ultra low latency, uh, extremely high throughput. There are different kind of frequency band, millimeter wave, uh, low low band, mid band, high band. Um, so high high band like millimeter wave uh, communications. Uh, you have high frequency, so a lot of bandwidth, but the range is limited, right? So there was interesting talk. Uh, I think keynote talk yesterday. Uh, so depending on what is the sparse deployment or dense deployment, you can choose what kind of uh, access point. Then massive MIMO, uh, there are a lot of talks. I think uh, yesterday there was a keynote talk about that. Uh, Nilesh gave that talk. Uh, densification of small cell because of the uh, coverage. You have multiple of those. Uh, converse networks, wireless backhaul access integration because uh, your things like fires, fiber can be complemented, right? And then as you start moving towards the core, uh, you have software defined networking, uh, network function virtualization that will give you the programmability and uh, independence of the uh, proprietary system. You can just have your own virtualized system. Closed loop automation orchestration, something happened in the network, how quickly you can detect and mitigate, let's say, attacks or performance overload. 
The mobile is cloud will provide the ultra low latency application. Network slicing, uh, example of different types of application, think about like a high occupancy vehicle, right? Uh, you have automotive application, you have uh, fast responder, mission critical. They can all have different kind of quality of service end to end. Uh, radio access network, cloud RAN. So there is a big initiative within India, uh, as you all know, Open RAN, right? Uh, and I, so Lekha and uh, Sankhya Labs, they have been so it's a prototype. Uh, CDOT is, have this, this consortium that people are working on uh, coming up with Open RAN solution, uh, indigenous Open RAN solution. That's an interesting uh, part of 5G. Uh, Service-based architecture moving away from proprietary protocol based to uh, HTTP, REST, JSON uh, based interaction, right? I'll show you some example of that. This is a whole service oriented network approach that was being prevalent in IT is now becoming uh, prevalent in cellular network. And then heterogeneous networks, micro cell, small cell, right? Moving around, uh, low band, high band, mid band, uh, device centric architecture, device to device communication. It was not only machine to machine. Uh, obviously, AI is getting into picture. Um, I think things like that. So this is just a very high level picture than cellular B2X type uh, also getting in there, right? So once you get an idea, uh, let me move quickly, uh, you put this together. So if you see this picture here, uh, you have the infrastructure like Edge Cloud, uh, then you have SDN controller, then uh, over here these are different slicing, these are network functions, then you have some kind of a uh, OSS, service management function, right? So this is a very high level picture and the, over here there are different kinds of uh, endpoints, right? Uh, robots or uh, cards, connected cards, uh, UABs, etc. And then, uh, sorry, um, then if you try to overlay, so we have 5G new radio, which is fiber-like performance, uh, multi-radio access technology, um, network function virtualization, that will give you uh, programmability, you can have multiple network functions running on the same hardware. Programmable network, SDN controller, uh, has the ability to change the firewall rules on the fly. If there's an attack happening, how quickly it detect and mitigate that. Uh, network slicing, as I told you, gives you the ability to provide quality of service end-to-end -end by sharing the resources on the network function, right? Uh, for example, your CPU, memory, um, uh, storage and all those uh, can be shared. Uh, so these are different emerging technology. This is a slide that I was talking about uh, different frequency. Uh, every country has the different uh, regulation. And what I'm showing here is low band, mid band, high band. If you're working in a high band, uh, high frequency, high bandwidth, the coverage is uh, limited. So you have to Depending on, let's say, Manhattan type or Delhi, Bombay type uh, city, uh, you have lots of density and you have lots of these cells. Uh, as far as the rural area, you can have low band and mid band. So there is a uh, advantage, disadvantage of each of these. Uh, use case, uh, so when 3GPP defines, uh, I know there are many 3GPP experts here, so this is just to tell you when they define, they have different pages. And for 5G, at least uh, three different pillars, mobile broadband, uh, machine to machine communication and ultra low latency. And the bottom you see the NABSD and Cloud RAN, Edge Computing, these are different enablers that are required to provide the kind of service. And the low hanging fruit here is the enhanced mobile broadband, which is uh, um, just the last half, right? If you have uh, uh, the new video in the last half, you can get high bandwidth. But you may not have, let's say I don't have Edge Cloud implemented, I cannot get ultra low latency. Uh, so the releases, uh, the implementation is dependent on the releases uh, from uh, 3GPP, right? And then the vendor uh, make it and then you test it and you deploy. Okay, so now let's go back to the drawing board again. Uh, so here this is the end-to-end -end system model. I am bringing it back now. So if you see on the left hand side, uh, I have end user, I have radio access network, which is now open RAN, we have DU, CU, and uh, RU, and then we have edge cloud, that will provide you the low latency application, right? And then you have uh, the user plane, this is my control plane, uh, data plane, which I store it here, and this has evolved from 4G. And then uh, I have, uh, these are my virtualization, like hypervisor or container, 
uh, orchestrated SDN controller, uh, then uh, IP multimedia subsystem, uh, you know, Geo started, Volt E, and now it's called Voice over NR. And then you go to either internet or, or if I'm roaming, so my subscribers in AT&T, now I'm here, maybe I'm connected to Vodafone or uh, Geo maybe. Uh, and so there are roaming uh, thing, and then untrusted 3GPP, non-3GPP, like Wi-Fi, right? So this is the integration there. Let me move forward. So just to give you a comparison, now EPC, which is called packet core, um, this is how it was looking like, and if you, there are few components, about 13 interfaces. Uh, if you compare that with the 5G core, uh, these are like network functions, uh, service space architecture, right? Uh, so you still have user plane. But well, most of these functions, they communicate among each other using HTTP JSON type, right? So if you see some of the functionality, unified access, functional decomposition, service space architecture, um, these are fundamental difference, uh, which are departure from 4G to make it more modular, right? So this also opens up the opportunity for the startups. And that means um, some startup can, um, you know, produce some network function, other startup can produce another network function, they can in interrupt it. So this becomes more modular, easy to manage, but at the same time it opens up a lot of other uh, challenges, right? Uh, so there are uh, two types, right now there are actually seven different types of options, because when you do transition, it cannot happen overnight. It's not like a Y2K problem, right? So you have to already a legacy system, and then you move to the real 5G. So what I'm showing here is um, non-standalone. That means your core network is still 4G. And because new radio is available, so you can still have high bandwidth on the access, but you're signaling uh, all those things will be still 4G. So this is 4G network. I can still have 5G access, right? So that's how people are defining, uh, actually deploying now. But then um, what will happen is when everything is called, they call it standalone, so this is how things are going to look like. So these are all 5G code, and this is all 5G RAN uh, with open RAN and everything. And you have N3IWF, which is the network function for uh, Wi-Fi. And then you have internet, you have IMS, roaming, etc. right? So this is uh, how things are going to migrate to, but that hasn't happened. Uh, some company like Rakuten probably doing that. So this is the path people are taking now, many of the operators, they are uh, now focusing on uh, option three, which is this one, right? Uh, so you still have UPC, but this will be your 5G code. So this is the eventual goal, right? Just to give you an idea how transition is taking place. All right, let's go a little bit deep. Um, uh, so this is again the core network architecture, right, it looks like, just to break it up. So you have uh, user endpoint, radio access network, this is the user plane. And these are the control plane, which are all service-based interface, right? And uh, 3GPP defines how they communicate. These are mostly HTTP or HTTPI based, right? So just just know that for now. Uh, if, if you break it up further, just to give you an idea, you saw so many different interface, right? Now, okay, you can hear me, right? Um, so if you see, uh, these are, uh, I'm now making a, uh, kind of connection between different network functions and the pure, pure point, let's say in this case, uh, UE is talking to G B, what is the interface, what is the protocol they're using. Uh, I, I'll tell you why I'm showing that, because if you know this, if you have to secure uh, any component, you need to know which protocol they're using and how do I secure that protocol, how do I secure that interface, right? And if you see most of the service-based infrastructure, now they are HTTP open API, you see this? So this used to be all diameter. So when they moved to service-based architecture, they all became HTTP open API based, uh, just, just to give you an idea. So our whole um, architecture looks different. It's more modular, more uh, standard focused. So with that, let me just uh, uh, get into security now. Uh, we got some idea about 5G. Uh, so when you look into security, it's like application security, device security, and there are always opportunities and challenges as well, right? So we have to look into the challenges uh, and also opportunities that you can take advantage of. I may have to skip some slides because of time, but let me give you an idea. So now I'm bringing this picture back again. And now we are, what we're going to do, we're going to overlay the security attacks that could happen, right? So you might be thinking, where the security, who is attacking me, how it is attacking, and unless you know the sources of attacks, 
the potential points on reflection, how do you know what mitigation technique I'll do? So first, the attacks could come from the endpoints. So you may or may not know your end device may be malware infected of times within the war in Ukraine, right? A lot of things uh, have been being jammed, things cannot communicate. Uh, so, you know, some malicious user can jam the network, so that is a attack. Uh, it could be on the Geno D, uh, management interface, physical attack, there's so many access towers out there, and there'll be more in 5G. And the back hall, uh, mid hall, front hall, right, with open RAN, you have now front hall, mid hall, back hall, right, so there may be attacks on those. Um, you have virtualization, right? So hypervisor container, things are getting virtualized. Attacks from the Wi-Fi networks, this has happened. There are a lot of interesting papers from Belgium, right? Uh, if you're connected from Wi-Fi to the core. Um, insider attacks, right? Orchestrated SDN controller, these are the new additional pillars. They may have problems. Attack from the internet side. There may be firewalls, there may be misconfigured, maybe some ports are not properly configured. And the roaming attacks. This used to be a lot of attacks in SS7, uh, and that um, got we got rid of that by getting rid of diameter. So these are like a very very high level picture of some of the attacks and threat vectors, right? And then I remember I talked about the protocols. Now the AMF is a control plane. So if I want to make sure my AMF is properly secured, I have to look into which other component is talking to, right? So on the left side is talking to my uh, G node B, right side I'm talking to another network function, and then which protocol I'm using. And do I have enough security uh, uh, policies to protect these uh, protocols, right? So I'm just showing an example of how you approach to make sure a specific component within a 5G core is secure. So that was on the control plane. On the user plane, same thing, right? So user plane, you have less interaction because you just send the data. Once you uh, authorize, authenticated, you send the data. So the data maybe somebody might be spoofing. So in this case, I need to make sure I have right protocols um, there to protect. So, so what is 3GPP doing? So 3GPP is defining the security architecture, uh, like 33501, uh, uh, and these are different domains. Uh, access security, domain security, user domain, application domain, SBA domain. I'm not getting into details of these. But if you read 33501, that defines the basic security infrastructure, what we need to have. And then they also talk about the uh, key hierarchy. That means you need to protect your user data, control data, uh, integrity, uh, encryption, all those. So they define the whole architecture, how you start with a certain key and authentication factor and generate keys to uh, encrypt uh, the data plane, user plane, right? So it's defining those. So 3 gpp is doing his work. Uh, they also have done uh, work to uh, take care of some of the problems with 4G. So if you see here, I'm comparing the 4G authentication with 5G authentication, right? So if you see uh, the difference, they added uh, additional um, parameters like SUSI, uh, SUPI. Uh, they got rid of diameter, for example, uh, HTTP-based web APIs. Uh, so this is how they are taking care of some of the weaknesses that 4G had, right? So this is just to summarize some of the 4G vulnerability, how 5G took care of some of those, but still 5G had some security risk, right? So, so if you are do, trying to see what are the 5G security we have, uh, we know that okay, 4G had some issues, 5G took care of it, but 5G has some additional uh, security that you need to take care of. Right. So once you know that, then what you do, and I, I, uh, because of time, I'll quickly go over some of this. How do you approach this? So now you decouple these uh, building blocks, radio access network, uh, core, IMS, and then pass to columns. If I'm a hacker, I try to know uh, how do I attack this network, right? So I can make the network unavailable, uh, confidentiality, loss of integrity, loss of control, etc. right? And then how do I do that? I plot an interface, grass network element. Here I'm talking about the radio access network, only one module, right? And how do I do that now? I can do denial of service attack by RF jamming, botnets, et cetera, right? And then on the right side, I'm showing uh, potential mitigation technique. The slides will be available, so uh, you don't have to read through each text. I just want to give you an idea how to approach a problem, security problem, right? So you looked at the RAN side, now you look into the core side. So move to the right. 
uh, and the core side, you have different kinds of uh, attacks could happen. Now, your uh, first two columns still remain same. The problem surface uh, changes, right? The protocols are different, the network functions are different. Right, so you see what could be the potential problems, and then you look at the mitigation technique. Then you go to the IMS, which is the application side, uh, IP multimedia subsystem, right? So voice over IP, etc. So here you are using a different types of protocols, such as an initiation protocol, uh, RTP. So protocols are different, your network functions are different, right? Uh, things like uh, spam over uh, IP telephony or telephony DDoS attack. Uh, somebody trying to ring you so many times from bogus numbers, right? So those are the kind of things. Uh, or somebody may change the quality of service. Uh, the header, uh, my mom is calling, uh, somebody else is calling, it looks like my mom is calling or my wife is calling, right? Those kind of problems. So you have to look into that. And then we now, depending on the API, application programming interface, right? So API uh, is good, SCTP API, but it also has its own potential problems. So you make a taxonomy of that and come up with mitigation technique. GTP, GPRS tunneling protocol. So this is a transport uh, level uh, tunnel uh, that <coughs> happens in user plane. So GTP itself uh, has also potential problems. So now you got to figure out as an architect, uh, what are the attacks and how can I take care of it? Uh, HTTP, now you saw those, right? API, HTTP, uh, REST API, so this is a, everybody's using it, so uh, people try to hack this, so there are problems there. And then REST API, right? Uh, this is the last one. So in, without going into details of this, so once you know that, then you figure out what is the risk. So risk uh, is a, a factor of likelihood and impact. So how likely that this network can be attacked. And NIST and, uh, has done a pretty good analysis on that. So it's a function of vulnerabilities, exposure, threats, and what kind of mitigating control you have, right? And the impact, how it's going to impact my business or users. So once you know that, then you've got to find out, uh, you're going to map that. So what I'm going to do in the next few slides, uh, these are the additional pillars that I talked about, right? So 5G compared to 4G uh, has SDN, open source, uh, network slicing, virtualization, orchestration, uh, AI predictive security, supply chain, that's becoming very important, edge cloud, cloud run. So these are the additional enablers that help us to provide those benefits. But it also comes with its own baggage. And uh, so what we're going to see, some of the opportunities that we can take advantage of from the security perspective and what are the problems. Um, this is an opportunity. An example I'm showing is a, is a closed loop automation. So. Um, the attack is coming from on the data plane or control plane. If I have the orchestration and SDN controller and these are different uh, security function, how quickly I detect where the attack is coming from. So I see there is a spike in the traffic. I don't know where it is coming from. I try to sort of instantiate my intrusion detection system and then I figure out it's coming from this country, this uh, endpoint and where it is going to then instance in my firewalls on the fly. So uh, having the ability of this programmability, I can program these firewalls on the fly. I program anything else on the routers, right? So this is a closed loop automation. Now, how quickly can I detect? Can I put it in my RAN on the code? So this is an opportunity that we can take advantage of, right? Security side. But there are challenges also. So my SDN controller could be attacked, right? Uh, through a hacker or somebody may try to do some kind of fudging attack, my SDN controller may be completely um, uh, you know, out of function. So what I did, uh, I tried to put them in a methodical way. Uh, so if I'm talking about SDN controller, what are the opportunities I can take advantage of, right? Uh, so resilience, enhanced programmability, programmability dynamic service chaining, etc. But on the challenge side, there are seven challenges I have written down. For each of these challenge, now you've got to find out what is the mitigation technique. And then you look at the risk likelihood and see, do I have to augment my security control? Right? So that's how you proceed. So this is the SDN controller. Uh, open RAN, uh, you all know about Open RAN, the whole radio access network is getting uh, modular. And for the Open RAN, you, have the, you do the similar uh, type of uh, analysis. Uh, what are the opportunities because of Open RAN? 
I can do edge detection. I can quickly detect if the attack is happening on the open RAN. Uh, but there are challenges associated with open RAN, right? Because in opening up the interface. And for each of these challenges, you have mitigation technique, risk security, threat likelihood. Uh, mobile edge cloud security. Why do you need mobile aids? Because you want to have ultra low latency application. Uh, but that means I have to do a lot of security authentication at the edge of the network because security authentication takes time. So um, if I try to analyze the same thing, uh, so Edge Cloud provides uh, a lot of opportunities like embedding security monitoring, performance optimization, reduce latency, etc. On the challenges side, uh, because I'm storing a lot of security in the edge, I'm doing visited authentication, uh, cache poisoning, and a lot of those things will happen. And for each of these, again, I have to figure out the mitigation technique, risk, severity, threat likelihood. Uh, uh, slicing provides quality of service, right? For different kinds of user, fast responder, uh, police, um, you know, somebody, uh, emergency service, uh, medical service, right? So they have different kind of quality of service. But what happens is if I have multiple slices, um, so one slice can attack another slice. If I'm a user connected to one slice, which is um, non-priority, the other one is priority, and the security policies may be different. So slicing itself imposes a lot of challenges, side channel attacks. Um, so we have to do potential mitigation technique for that. And then virtualization, uh, and obviously uh, that gives you ability to resilient, scale up, scale down the network uh, on the fly, but there are potential risks there. Uh, everybody using open source now. Open source, uh, even the, the vendors are also embracing it now, right? And I'll give some example later on. Uh, we actually right here on the right side, like Linux, uh, OpenStack, uh, OPNFB, ONF, uh, many, many of them, you know, all the whole ecosystem I showed, um, there are open source available. Uh, so there are advantages and disadvantages of that as well we need to keep in to mind. Open supply chain, this is a very debatable hot topic. I, when I, I was in the United States State Department, sent me once, uh, because I'm IEEE 5G guy, uh, to many countries in Europe to talk with their politicians and CTOs to talk about security, uh, supply chain security, and RAN, core, that's an interesting discussion. So, so what I'm showing here is, now you see the 5G, there are uh, components starting from your handset, IC chips. Many vendors are going uh, different ways uh, on the RAN, core, and so many things, right? So it is important to understand the potential risk that might come uh, from a, a specific vendor, right? So it is important. There needs to be some um, best current practice. There are many out there, and this is just an example, CSIS Working Group on Trust and Security in 5G Networks. Um, they have this political governance criteria, business practice, cybersecurity risk mitigation. You know, there are many things you need to keep in mind before a specific vendor is uh, integrated uh, into a network. All right, now standards, I know there's going to be a big uh, panel later on, uh, but just to give you an idea of some galaxy of standards, uh, ITF I talked about, 3GPD, uh, HC, IEEE, which, uh, you know, there are, you all use Wi-Fi, but there are a lot of IEEE standards, folks. Uh, WNAP, OPNAP, OAI, Open Daylight, uh, these are all open source, uh, SDN controller, um, uh, Open RAN Alliance, uh, ITU Linux Foundation has ONAP, uh, OpenStack, etc. Then ATIS, TS, DSI, you know, these are uh, local standards bodies that are champions of um, some of these standards representing in 3JPP. Uh, so important to keep track of those. Then a little bit on testbed. Uh, while we understand the uh, 5G and how it gets developed, and um, the standards get defined, the vendors make products, and of the day you have to deploy it. So it is important to have test beds. There are various test beds. I know in India we have test beds here too. This is an example of National Science Foundation. Um, and within APL, we are a member of that. So there are like four different uh, test beds, actually five with Colossium. Uh, depending on uh, what specific part of the 5G you want to do, Let's say if you want to do uh, Masi MIMO, you go to Salt Lake City. If you want to do millimeter wave, go to New York City. If you want to do drone based, you go to Apple. Or if you go to the rural wireless broad broadband, you go to ARA. So what we did, we talked to the Department of Homeland Security, DOD, and all those uh, companies. We bring their 10 points 
I said, how 5G can help? So we come up with, okay, you need low latency users cloud, you need orchestration uh, to take care of congestion and all those. Then we try to uh, experiment that in our lab. Then we go out to this big uh, test bed to try out the feasibility, go to Manhattan or Salt Lake to see the scalability, right? So this is very important. This is just to give you an idea, test bed in Salt Lake City, Cosmos test bed in New York City. Within IEEE, just for information, this is very fresh news. Uh, we are working with Tech Mahindra to integrate and uh, build a virtual 5G lab within IEEE. That will be accessible to uh, anybody in the world. Uh, you can be a consortium member if you're a company, you're academic, you'd like to get access for your students, you can do that. Um, so this is happening, uh, there's going to be a press release, but uh, this just, we got finalized just at the beginning of the year. Uh, Tech Mahindra is doing an excellent job in trying to integrate uh, this. Um, there are already uh, many users who are, who are part of the consortium. Uh, we are also inviting any academics. Or I was talking to Shankar Labs and Lekha. Uh, they can also be part of it. You can bring your own computer. Nokia addiction there. Or we are also talking to them. So this is something to keep in mind. Um, the example I was giving, I'll finish in the next part, three, four minutes. Uh, operational gaps, this is an example of uh, when Department of Homeland Security came to us and this active shooter scenario unfortunately happens quite a lot in the United States. Uh, they said, you know, we have big problems with 4G. Uh, these are the problems they laid out. Uh, then can 5G help it? I said, yeah, sure, let's do it. Then we came up with this, then we did a mapping here. Uh, what are the, the scenario, the gaps, and how 5G can take care of these gaps? Right, so we, we did a map, mapping that with a proof of concept. Uh, we showed it was taking 10 seconds, brought it down to five milliseconds. Uh, there was congestion happening because when a lot of people start calling, uh, the packets are dropping quality of service, so we use the orchestration automation to take care of that. So, and so and so forth. So I'm just trying to see how theory to practice and test pet and standards, they all come together. Finally, um, the Future Networks Technical Community used to be uh, Future Network Technical Initiative, uh, Future Network Initiative. Uh, so I was the, one of the founding co-chair, Team Lee, Gerard Petweiss, the other one. But right now I'm the chair for Technical Community. It graduated from Future Direction, is a technical community by itself. There are nine societies who are financial sponsors. We do a lot of things. There is an opportunity for everybody here to get connected. Uh, the Future Networks World Forum, Connecting the Unconnected, this digital divide, Professor Sudhir Dikhit and I, uh, we started this two years back. Um, there's a very interesting thing. There are winners from India, actually, 2021 and 2022. Uh, Roadmap, which are 14, 15 different working groups you want to get involved. This is the website, futurenetworksitw.org. Uh, if you want to get involved, uh, give talks, a lot of free seminars, uh, uh, the Future Network Wall Forum is coming up uh, in November. We also have been doing, along with uh, uh, Communication Society, uh, I, we started that in Princeton University 2015. Some of you may have attended the 5G summits. Um, we got about 92 of those so far around the world. So if you want to do some time in IIT Guwahati, we can definitely do that. I've uh, never done that in this part of the country. Um, so, and if you want to get access to this, INGR, this is a three-year, five-year, ten-year roadmap. Uh, you can get access to this uh, going through the website. So you have, as you can see, uh, security application, millimeter wave, uh, test bed, deployment, uh, etc. There are like 14 of those. There could be more. There is a way to join. These are different working group co-chairs. You can uh, connect with them and send mail. We have bi-weekly uh, meetings. Uh, we can be an author of the contributor to this roadmap. Uh, this is a little ad, this just came up. Uh, uh, this is the sixth one we're doing. In fact, 2020 was supposed to happen in Bangalore, and, but COVID hit, so we, we had to do virtual. We'll bring it back to India again physically, but uh, last year it was in Montreal, this year we're doing in Baltimore. So if you are planning to submit papers, want to speak, uh, let me know. I'm the founding co-chair for that. Uh, this is our uh, Sahani Shuldrin, he's kind of father of uh, internet telephony, by the way, he's my PhD advisor from Columbia University. And these are, we are still looking for other volunteers if you want to uh, participate uh, here. Uh, with that, let me, um, yeah, so this is the test bed closed loop automation that we did. 
Uh, this is the low latency application, how he brought down from 10 seconds to 5 millisecond. You know, this is the test bed I was talking about. And this is the network slicing. So these are the three experiments we did. So this is kind of my uh, last, almost last slide. Uh, the key points of 5G adoption uses, so there are a lot of technical barriers. I spoke some of those. Uh, RF related issues, uh, the complexity of operation. I didn't get a chance to talk about cultural barriers, the environmental issues. We often get asked by uh, those questions. And there's a deployment working group who is working on it, uh, David Witkowski. So if you want to know more about it, let me know. The policy barriers, every company has, every country has their own policy spectrum, dynamic spectrum sharing, etc. right? So this is a lot of issues going on too. So we are in a very interesting uh, junction, right, where 5G deployment is in full swing, but at the same time, we have started looking into 6G, like RTS Next Year Alliance, for example, right? Um, I know RTS VSI also has a 6G group. Uh, so in summary, uh, the motivation is for the new network evolution because new application coming up, and we need a network that is adaptable, resilient, and flexible um, to support that. So that's why we're building new network. But when you do that, there are new enablers, new features, but at the same time, there are, um, they give rise to some new issues. So we take advantage of the opportunities, but there are some challenges. I laid down some of those. Uh, it's important, um, it should not be ad hoc in nature. We should have a systematic approach to solve that problem, like analyze, uh, open it up. And I gave some examples of how to do a systematic approach to that. Um, so once you do that, investigate the gaps, look at the risk, analysis, uh, look at what protocol, security control protocols you have, uh, controls you have, you can augment that. So if your risk factor is red, bring it down to green, and then you have to add additional security uh, controls, right? Uh, finally, the collaboration among operators, vendor, regulators, academy is essential. So things like this, what we're doing is very important. We get a chance to interact, uh, listen to the experts, uh, the vendors, academics who provide the real research, uh, students, um, they do a lot of good stuff. Uh, and, and finally, the standard testbed and proof of concept, uh, which are essential part of the ecosystem. Uh, it has to happen every time. If things don't work, go back to standard fix it, right? Uh, like TA 5GI and from TSDSI, right? The low, I think low mobility, all those not represented in 3GPP. So kudos to TSDSI for bringing it up, taking to 3GPP and making it happen. Um, this is a big step, by the way. Uh, so finally, this is an interesting time. This is my last slide, folks. I Sorry, I ran out of time a little bit. Uh, but I wanted to give you an idea as part of my talk uh, what 5G is all about. People have different notions. Uh, how they work, how it is different, better than 4G of previous generation. Uh, then I try to talk about security a little bit. How 3GPP has given some fundamental security, but there are additional security we need to look into, uh, depending on the security use case and come up with a security practice. And then um, I highlighted the testbed aspects. Talking about open source, uh, this is uh, open appeal to folks and academia at least. Uh, if you want to do experimental research, build, please build your open testbed and collaborate with others. But you can, even literally within 15 days, you can get your 5G testbed up and running. I have done it, so if you need any technical advice, let me know. Uh, and I guess uh, the collaboration is the last one that I was uh, hinting on. It's important to have this kind of interaction. Um, with that, I don't know whether I have any time for questions, but I'll be happy to take any questions now, later.